coming up now, we have a discussion around uh, virtual reality and learning by doing more. Uh, and I want to introduce Tom Simmons uh, to the stage. He's going to be chairing the panel. Um, Tom has worked as a leader in a number of different businesses in the last 20 years and is constantly looking for roles where there's an opportunity to innovate, disrupt, and challenge existing thinking. Thank you. Right. Thank you all for uh, coming and uh, being part of this uh, panel session that uh, we're going to talk a little bit about virtual reality. Many people would say that that is the future of learning. Um, I'm very fortunate to have three very talented people on the panel today. Um, maybe you'd just like to introduce yourself first of all. Diana, would you like to go first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Good to see you here today. I'm a managing director in Accenture Strategy, and I lead our work on culture and behavior change, and also work whenever possible with my talented colleagues in the audience in learning strategy as well. Good afternoon. My name is Jean. I'm um, a surgeon in my past, and uh, now a co founder of a company called Touch Surgery, which is based in the UK and the US. Uh, we're the largest mobile platform for uh, global surgical training on a mobile device. Um, we've had a little bit of experience with VR, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to being part of this. Hi, I'm Henry. I feel a bit like a Bond villain in this chair. <laughs> You're just missing a cat. I yeah, am, I should do. <laughs> Third-rate Bond villain. Um, yeah, so I'm the, I'm the former um, Director of Innovation for, for Pearson. I'm currently CIO of uh, an African edtech company called Mwabu. Great. Thank you. And I'm, I'm Tom. Um, I run Immerse Learning. And I get to wear really nice colored t-shirts. Yellow's always been my color. So I was delighted when I got this out of the box, as you can imagine. So um, let's uh, maybe just, first of all, kick off. Uh, uh, again, I'll, I'll go to Diana, if that's OK. Just initially, some, some general thoughts on, on virtual reality. Because as I'm sure everyone in the audience knows, virtual reality is often, I think, possibly misunderstood uh, as a term. There's different obviously many different applications of that in terms of the hardware and the software. So, Diana, what are your, what are, what are your initial thoughts on that, on the virtual reality space, if sure. I may? Um, I'll share my thoughts based on having just trialled the experience myself. I think what we're looking for and what our clients definitely are looking for is experiential learning, which captures the imagination of the learners. Everyone has had years, decades even, of traditional learning, and they want to be far more engaged and have an experience that is as close as possible to the reality of the work they'll be doing. For me, that's where VR comes in. It gives people an opportunity, especially in certain industries like energy, pharma, where the equipment is so expensive, you're not going to want to unleash learners on it without a safe space to learn. It gives them the opportunity to try and fail and learn from the failing and learn as they go along. So it's exciting. It feels like you're playing. And it gives organizations a chance to equip people, a distributed workforce, with skills and capability that they might not otherwise have the chance to learn. So uh, pre this new generation of headsets, because that seems to be the, the, the catalyst, headsets that don't actually make you reach for a bucket after having them on for, for two minutes. How would you have serviced that need for experiential training in your clients before this new generation of headsets, Dana? What's a... I think you know, we have, would have mocked up situations for them, simulations where they would walk through, but it, it doesn't have that same feeling of the experience that you're actually in the real space. So there's always that transfer of learning. Um, I think also people are looking for an ability to connect with others in their learning. They want social learning. They want the peer-to-peer -peer connection. They want to be able to connect across their organization and learn from other people's learning. So this new technology is making it more powerful and impactful on them so they can share the learning of what they've experienced with even more color and um, vivid um, experience to it. Great, thank you. Uh, John, so what, what would you say? You're, I mean, you're, you have this 
amazing, amazing touch surgery business you built up. You're using different technologies to bring those experiences to life. How? What are your 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 thoughts on the space? Yeah. So we've been looking at VR for like a while now, um, and I guess kind of just a background for everyone. Um, when I trained as a surgeon, uh, I was learning to operate on people. In fact, there's a saying in surgery which is "see one, do one, teach one." Does that make you guys feel all comfortable? Uh, <laughs> um, so simulation has been something that we've really tried to adopt from the aviation industry. And you know, today a pilot has to do 10,000 hours. It's the magic number that everyone quotes, right? Before they get in a plane and fly the plane. But actually, the pilot doesn't fly the plane. It's flown by a computer. Um, and then ultimately, they just manage certain situations, right? Um, and so I guess simulation within healthcare is something that is what I describe as the content layer. Now, whether that content layer is uh, distributed through you know, physical versus mobile versus VR, um, it comes down to the question of you know, what is going to be the most useful for a specific situation, and is there going to be the right level of immersion? And then there's a bunch of questions which revolve around the academic evidence for things which is typically what kind of healthcare looks at, right? Um, and so back to kind of like personal experiences with VR, when we started looking at it, the Oculus was the dominant platform that was out. And so we had the version one, which we all loved. Um, and I guess the question that we all kind of asked was, was the resolution going to get any better? And how much interactivity was there going to be? Um, and I think that having played around with um, your product actually today, the Vive. Um, I think there are certain applications that you just feel, wow, this is this feels right for it, because you know they don't need that level of interactivity. It it gets the point across. Um, whereas there's other content plays where I think that the content the the platform isn't ready for that type of content, and so it, it comes down to the old you know content is king, and is the content ready for the platform yet, and or is it vice versa? Great, thank you. And Henry, what are your... What are my thoughts? Um, how many people, show of hands, how many people in the audience have actually tried virtual reality? Stick your hand up if you've tried it. I can see a few people that haven't. OK, put your hands down. Put your hands up if you've tried like the fixed ones, where you, not, not, the, not the mobile headsets, the fixed stuff. One, two, three, a few. OK, that's really interesting. So I think, what do I think? So I think there are two types of people. I think there are people that think that virtual reality is a game-changing medium. And I think that there are people that haven't tried it yet. Um, <laughs> I think it is absolutely a game-changer. But it is just a, it's a medium that's, that's only just starting. I see a lot of parallels with the emergence of cinema. We all saw um, those, those historical videos of people watching the train come towards them. You remember yeah. this? With the train coming towards them with a fixed camera and people would go in for the experience. Um, I think we're kind of at that stage right now. We haven't even got to Battleship Potemkin no. yet. We haven't got to Chaplin. Uh, we're still at a very, very early stage. But I think the future is extremely exciting. But it's going to come down to creatives, creatives like yourself, to, to look at how you can use the medium, how you can drive it forward, and how, crucially, with this audience, how you can use that in a pedagogically sound way. And I think we've all sat through stuff that was possibly pedagogically dubious. Very true. Very, very true. Or crap, I yeah. suppose, is the other yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> and use that sort of language on yes. stage. <laughs> um, and so in terms of kind of more obvious applications in terms of sector, I mean, Jean, you've talked a bit, of, obviously, about the, the medical space. Diana, what would you... Are there any sectors that kind of spring out at you as, as, as obvious places to apply the technology? I mean, I, mean, I, I think... Sectors like energy. I think I'd, I'd also look at it from the other way around, though. Look at it from the perspective of what do graduates want. We've just done a graduate survey, which asks thousands of graduates um, globally, what are they looking for from an employer? And it's not just about what the company thinks they can do with the technology. It's what the graduates who are their future leaders are looking for from their organizations that they join. Um, and many of them are not looking to join huge corporates. 
but they're no longer looking to join startups either. It's actually the small medium enterprises. You know, the medium ones are coming back into fashion with graduates. And they're looking for purpose, they're looking for capability development, and they want recognition. And when you can bring together this style of capability development in a way that feels much more like their personal life has felt. You know, every game, every way they've interacted with friends, you know, multiplayer games, it's moved towards this style. So they're not going to accept a type of learning that doesn't feel this experiential. So it's not just about what the organization can think of as a reason to use it and willing to invest in, it's also what the learners are going to be asking for. Yeah, well, I certainly agree with that. Um, Jean, in terms of where you see the most obvious applications in, in medical, which, I mean, if you had to create a pilot, where would you, where would you want to start? Do you think surgery is a good place to start, or Look, would you? I, I think it's going to take off in entertainment, you know, games and yeah. other forms of entertainment, depending on how you classify it. But I think entertainment is going to be key, right? I think approaching VR... I think you have to approach VR with like a VR first mindset, if you know what I mean, to make best use of the platform. Because if you think about it, you know, you have to rotate your head around, view things behind you to the left of you, to the right of you. Typically, if you're watching a movie, you don't do that. You know, the movie's in front of you. Or typically, if you're playing a game today, you don't really, you know, use your head a lot. Within surgery, right? you don't typically move your head around a lot either. You don't move around the patient, you're like, you know, you're not doing any of that, your head is pretty focused and you're looking at a focused center point and every now and again, you kind of like, you know, look to the left and try to evaluate depth and looking around things. But yeah, I, I think the first most obvious use case is gonna be entertainment. And um, we have this spectrum that we look at, which is like learning on one side and then fun on the other. Uh, and I guess, somewhere between those two parts of the spectrum, I think there's gonna be like a, a real kind of entertainment slash learning element to VR, uh, which I think will be the biggest use case initially. And Henry, what about education? So where, where, where do you start introducing it into that sector, which is probably not famed for its um, rapid adoption of new technologies? How dare possibly, you? Possibly, such a possibly. progressive I sector. might be wrong, but... Um, so I think, so look, VR is good for some things, and it's not good for other things. And the danger is we end up... What's it not good for? Well, I, I find a really good VR experience has kind of three things, right? Well, uh, three. The first is that it needs to be something that benefits from seeing the environment. Okay? If you're teaching algebra, actually, you probably want people's field of vision relatively focused. Yeah. But actually, um, when you're teaching them something where the environment is important... That's good for VR. Um, I mean, you've seen the stuff that we did. Uh, when I was at Pearson, we, we launched the, um, the first ever virtual reality health and safety course. And that, that for me, ticked all three of these boxes. That, so the first was being able to view environment, to be able to see that you know, if you've got a ladder with a broken rung, perhaps you might not want to climb it. Um, the second piece is around how often you're going to be showing this. Because what we find with VR is that um, because it's new, because it's different, because it's it's immersive and takes you out of your day-to-day, -day. triggers a couple of different chemicals. It triggers dopamine, it, do it triggers uh, noroepiphene, uh, which are two great chemicals for, for actually building those synaptic pathways. And what I mean by that is that you have a one-off hit that actually helps you to cement a piece of knowledge. So if you do it on an ongoing basis, it, it loses its efficacy. But as a one-off hit, it's great. So for something like health and safety that you do, of course, once, it, it's fab. Yeah. And then the third piece is around um, the, the business case, frankly. This is why we're seeing more and more stuff happening in the, the vocational space, because the amount of uh, money there is, frankly, per learner is significantly higher. For this to really translate into schools, I think it's got a way to go. I really love the stuff that Google is doing. I don't know if there's any Googlers in the, uh, in the auditorium here, but uh, what Google are doing with uh, their expedition stuff yeah. is, is seriously cool. It needs yeah. to move to video, but it, yeah. it will do soon. Yeah. So, so in terms of, how much of it do you think is age specific? So Diana, when you're thinking about some of these wonderful change programs that you implement, how, how much is, of it is about aiming at a specific age group and how much of it is, is sector specific? 
I, I think the you know, age question is the same as do millennials exist? It's actually an irrelevant question. It's about the mindset. Are there people who are receptive and want to learn in this way and have that experience? Yes, there are. Are people going to be turned off by it? I'd be surprised. I think it's a question of are they, is it available to them and can they see the immediate benefit to the work they do and their career success? And then if it's available, it's again, as always with learning, it's building a habit and making it something that they reach for so it, it's part of the whole rather than a point solution to something. So um, I don't think it's age specific. I um, think it's about being receptive to this style of learning. And also linked to the culture of the company or do you think that's, is that relevant or not? I think the, the challenge with the culture of any company is not all companies have learning in their DNA. They don't necessarily adopt a way of learning because they're so focused on success. They don't look at the way they um, have innovated, the way they've experimented. They don't, they don't try and try to fail. So it could be easily accepted in an organisation where the culture is receptive to learning and that's part of who they are. I think other organisations, they all need to step back from some of their we must succeed, we must achieve this um, you know, statement to the market, no matter what, in order to be more open to this. Because it's, it's going to be new, it's going to stretch people, and the status quo is always very comfortable for the people within the organisation, and their behaviours are what sum up to the culture. So there's, there's possibly going to need to be a shift in the culture and the leader's shadow and how they embrace learning and how they're willing to try this on themselves um, and how learning gets embedded in what people are measured on and what's encouraged and reinforced. Great. So, Jean, just tell us a bit more about when you, when you think about technology and how you're applying it to your space. How do you go about implementing new technologies? Is there a, is there a strategy that yeah. you've adopted with, with touch surgery and... I guess we um, we do so collaboratively, collaboratively. So, you know, we don't lead with the technology; we lead with the problem, right? You know, I think that, especially kind of in healthcare, people tend to be a little bit more conservative, and you know, leading with a technology sometimes people just you know they they you end a conversation and they said, look, you know, I've heard this conversation hundreds of times before. You know, every now and again, someone comes in with a really shiny toy. And so I guess what we do is we lead with a problem, right? And so if you're really trying to address a clear problem, then the technology should be an obvious solution and it should be a no-brainer, right? Um, because at the end of the day, like, you know, the other thing is accessibility and affordability and all the other things that, you know, all the procurement guys come in and talk to you about, right? Um, and so... As we've built things, we've been very collaborative, we've been problem first, we've been technology as a, you know, an enabler, and we've really tried to make sure that we build a, a loop for as much feedback as possible. And we never go in and say, this is the all singing end of solution. It's more, you know, this could be part of a solution. How do we better make it work? Um, so I guess that's how kind of we've been doing things. Um, Is there any specifics with regard to geography? I mean, are you finding yeah. there's, a, there's a, a high propensity to adopt in the US, for example, compared to Europe, or yeah. does it yeah, differ? So this is a common question that gets asked in the UK. Um, we are much more um, established in the US as a company. So we're in places like Harvard and Hopkins, as part of the training curriculum in Stanford, in NYU, in UPenn, in a lot of different places. And we work with a lot of US-based clients. So, you know, J&J, Stryker, a lot of people for touch surgery. Um, I don't know whether or not that's because there's a difference in, you know, interest. I think it's just because there's a much larger market in the US. And so we ended up being kind of very US-centric in the beginning. Um, at the same time, if you look at where VR kind of startups are being concentrated right now, I mean, Oculus and Facebook is kind of a West Coast play. Um, 
you know, Apple, it's I hear doing things, uh, as is Google, and you know, they're very West Coast centric, so. Yeah, and Henry, obviously your, your new African venture, I mean, how do you see the adoption of new technology? There, obviously th things tend to be very mobile driven, mm -hmm. and how is that gonna, how do you see that evolving over time? Well, look, I think we can safely say that VR is gonna move to, to mobile. Just if you look at the install base, what has you got, 10, 15 million um, odd uh, PCs install base in the US at the moment, you've got, so one and a half billion mobiles, uh, mobile, we kind of know where this is going to go. Um, and mobile adoption across Africa is, is, is huge. We're at roughly 80% market saturation now. Um, smartphones are growing out, give or take 30%, but growing hugely year on year. I spent some time recently in, in a place called Shinyanga in, in rural Tanzania. I've got smartphones. Piece I'm really interested in that. Well, this is a bit of a diversion here, but the bit I'm really interested in is actually how can we use this technology to bring uh, education to some of the poorest parts of the world. Now, what role VR has in that, I honestly don't know. I'm three weeks into the job, so I couldn't couldn't tell you. But it's certainly something that I'm going to be looking at. But one of the things I think that's, that's just a slight segue, really interesting about VR is people tend to think of it as there's VR over here and then there's AR, uh, this augmented reality. And these two things are very separate. And for now, they absolutely are. But I think you're going to see a lot of convergence. I see it very much as, as a spectrum. And where it gets really interesting is, is kind of in, in the middle of that. I think some of the stuff that, that you're doing, which actually I'd, I'd love you to speak a bit about, um, is, is genuinely interesting. Do you want to just, I don't know how much you guys have seen of what Tom's doing, but it's worth Yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to create a much more engaging online experience of so combining 3D technology, live voice, uh, and more traditional e-learning, um, and applying that to sort of real-world problem solving. So, you know, we're, we're working in the, in the pharmaceutical sector, creating uh, decontamination training for specific equipment. So what it's allowing us to do um, it is to offer our clients this, this ability to engage a, a globally distributed workforce. And once you've created the 3D environment, and it, by the way, it doesn't always have to include VR. It often doesn't because VR is so, so new. But what it allows our, our customers to do, our partners to do, is train their workforce in theory all day, every day, instead of having to rely upon a training facility or a, or a giant simulator where they book a space and they can maybe use it for two hours, a, you know, maybe a year or a month. Once we build them the environment, they have access to it as a live learning experience all day, every day. And because of the wonders of, the, of, of 3D, you can pretty much replicate any object, any environment, and now any, any scenario. And I think what, what VR brings uh, for our clients is this just unbelievable level of immersion in the experience so that once you have that headset on, it's impossible to think about how beautiful your wife is. You, you just can't think about anything else. Um, it's completely flooding all your senses. I often and think about how beautiful your wife is. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so that is the point that you've got this complete focus of, of the learner in a way that you couldn't possibly achieve in any other medium. And that's, you know, I think that's why we, we, we would probably all say that everything will move in that direction over time. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of what are the, the milestones and where are the sectors and where are the applications and what are the problems that, that are most relevant, uh, I would say. Um, so, um, and so um, maybe just open up a little bit to, uh, to the audience uh, as well. Let's, any questions that have, uh, that have come to you so far that you'd like to put to the panel? I'm going to get this stony silence. It's not, I take it as a good yeah. sign. You've answered every question, Tom. Anything, any, uh, any, anything you'd like to, uh, well, while to they raise think about, a question? Well, actually, yeah, maybe it is a question for the audience. I mean, when I, I spent quite a lot of time looking at, at virtual reality and looking at augmented reality um, in my time at Pearson, 
And whilst I, I found some really interesting cases of VR, I really struggled to find stuff that was really efficacious with uh, augmented reality. Endless pop-up books with, oh, I can see a heart, great, but I didn't really do much um, beyond what I could probably get in a video or, or, frankly, from a book. So I was wondering, has anyone actually seen anything that they think is, is pedagogically brilliant, is really exciting in the AR space? No. I think that's a no. Um, <laughs> Jean, you have done some good stuff in the R space. Do you want to maybe share a bit of that with the audience? Not really, but... <laughs> uh, I mean, it's too early for us to talk about it. But I guess the way that we view the world is... VR is all immersive. And I've been trying to shoot them, and then you could think I'd want some, something. But you know, I'm obviously wearing a helmet of some sort. But um, the other form that we think about is, well, the world is like flooded with data, and how much of that data is useful um, in an AR view, and how can that then change the decisions that you make, and does that give you contextual information that's really interesting at different points? Um, because you know, we all have a job to do, we all do different things. So bringing contextual information relevant to you at that at specific point, does that make your decisions better? Does that make you more efficient? Does that make you more effective? It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, I mean, down, down the line, there is likely to be some amazing stuff with augmented reality. I mean, we, before I left, um, helped kick off um, a program with Microsoft. Have you seen the HoloLens, Microsoft's HoloLens? I think this is really cool. It's really, really exciting. So there's a whole bunch of work going on using that. We're also looking at, um, again, some stuff in the vocational training space, being able to layer metadata onto real world things. So for example, oil rigs, oil rigs, terrifyingly dangerous places, um, but being able to walk around an oil rig um, and have stuff labeled and be able to say, something goes wrong, you might want to push that button, technical term, you might want to push that button or pull that lever or, or whatever it is. Um, I can see all sorts of interesting applications in, in that space. I mean, look, fundamentally, in the vocational world, we have a major, major problem. We need to train people faster, and we need to train them cheaper. The, I mean, you'll have probably heard this said today already, but the kids of today are going to be doing jobs that don't even exist, and they're not going to be doing a single job for a long period of time, right? Yeah. So they're going to need to be training. They're going to need to retrain. And so we need to find better ways of doing this. And I think AR and VR offer some really interesting opportunities down the line. I mean, the other obvious difference between AR and VR is that with one, you're more likely to walk into a wall. And the other, <laughs> you're not as likely to do so. Yeah. Um, thank you for picking up on that point. <laughs> um, so I, I guess if you look at what everyone's putting out right now in VR, sorry for everyone in the room who's focused on learning, but most of it is gaming, right? And the gamers just can't get enough. And actually, I'm sure the first thousand Oculuses went to gamers, and you know everything kind of from VR headset is going out to the gamers because they're they're just pumped about having a new medium to be able to play their games. Gaming, though, has traditionally become, or traditionally at one point in time, I remember from my experiences, when I was, I was trying to do medical school and all I would ever do is play video games. I was that kid, you know, the mother came and like, took me away and confiscated my, my PlayStation. Um, gaming traditionally has a very good way of engaging people and making you do repetitive tasks again and again and again to score better and better and better. In doing so, you acquire skill sets that include problem solving, <coughs> include you know, whether you're playing SimCity, right? uh, you know, planning cities, you know, stopping all those traffic jams. So there are lots of things that I think education can take away from gaming. The positive things, not the killing kind of other people, right? that, but the positive things. And so I think if, as a platform, VR feels like 
the gamers have really started to think about mechanics around what, you know, how to problem solve, finding that puzzle, finding that jigsaw, you know, trying to figure things out. I think if we can learn from that and then also combine the learning, then as a platform, it has the ability, I think, to engage learners in the same way that a game does yeah. um, and drive learning in a much more interesting way. And trying your demo out today, it felt like a bit of a game, although I'm sure I was trying to learn something, which is you know, putting the machinery in place. But I, I was actually enjoying doing so. Right? And you know, I, I don't know anyone who has got a maths book and said, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I love maths, but you know, typically learners don't enjoy learning and can't wait to learn, right? So, but. And I, Diana, I, yeah. Please. Well, I think that the distinction is between learning and playing and more and more learning in organizations and ultimately behavior change in organizations, which is what this is about, is through gamification. It's making it feel like you're playing when you're also learning. It's not it's one or the other, it's both together and it's in line with the style of that organization. So some organizations and ones I've worked with closely, they are trying to dial up collaboration trying to get people out of the silos, working across functions, geographies, business units, whatever it is. And they might be such a competitive organization that they will create a game, which is who can be the most collaborative. You know, the irony is there, it's strange. How would you create something that's let's compete to be most collaborative? But that's exactly what they do, because they're putting that play into the learning of new behaviors and new ways of working together. Thank you. Any any other questions from there? So, but how important do you think that the kind of the, the fun word is? Because I, we were we were doing quite a lot of work in the oil and gas sector last year, and I thought I I dare not use the fun word because I'll get laughed out of the room by a big Texan oilman. Uh, and I remember them saying when we we created this lifeboat demonstration module, and he said, "Tom, this is really fun." And I thought, well, I I'm glad you've said that. But it was you know that. The fun piece is something, something you would possibly shy away from, thinking well, you're well, trivialising. Well, I think it's in energy, it's because the safety word is up front and centre. And I worked with BP following the Gulf of Mexico oil spill when they were looking at the culture values behaviours. So it's not, is this going to be safe or is it going to be fun? It's, is it engaging? Yeah. Is it going to capture people's attention and want them to prioritise that over you know, the email traffic, the meetings, the discussions? And it needs to be engaging. That doesn't diminish the focus on safety, excellence, quality, whatever it is, which is the content. Yeah. I think we should stop putting those words in separate places. Yeah. Like I know, you know, typically we do, but like ultimately describing something as fun doesn't necessarily mean that it's not teaching you safety. Mm. You know, fun is a process of enjoyment whilst doing something. Right? The, the education yeah. sector has struggled with this for forever, right? Um, it used to be referred to as chocolate-covered broccoli. You know, you give them something that was that was fun, and you try and crowbar something healthy into it as well, the learning into it. Um, and usually, it was terrible, really bad, like really bad. I mean, I've sat through so many demonstrations of educational games, which I can't give that example because it'll be <laughs> quite clear who it is. Um, but there's a lot of really terrible stuff, and I don't think virtual reality is is going to solve that to be honest, because I think it's going to come down to the creatives. This is just a medium. It's just a really cool medium, right? It's what you do with it. And we have to remember that we're right at the beginning of it. And what I want to see is, is, is smart people hacking stuff together with blue tack and string and coming up with great ways that are going to teach and learn. You know some of like, the best learning experiences I've seen? So I've got some kids. Um, this is nothing to do with virtual reality, by the way, but bear with me. Um, I got some kids teaching fractions to other kids who didn't know how to do it. And they're making videos. And, um, and the most successful ones were a couple of kids with a samurai sword and a watermelon taking videos. <laughs> you, you couldn't encourage them to do this, right? <laughs> but it was incredible. And the kids absolutely loved it. And it was really compelling because they were, they were creative and they were imaginative. And what I think is fab about these tools is they're getting cheap enough now that they can be put in the hands of pretty much anyone. And then you can do some really funky things with it. So that's why I'm excited by this. It's a whole new medium. Great. Thank you. Well, I think our time is up, unless anyone has a, a final question. <laughs> We're going to dance so on we're stage. Being, uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.